Good evening and welcome to Live from Prairie Lights. I'm Lindsay Park. Tonight we are pleased to present poetry and fiction reading from two Writers Workshop graduates and an alumna from the International Writing Program. Our three authors are Sandra Lim, James Shea, and Dorothy Shea. First up, Sandra Lim will read from The Wilderness, which was selected by Louise Gluck for the Barnard Women Poets Prize in 2013. Louise Gluck says, in its stern and quiet way, Sandra Lim's The Wilderness is one of the most thrilling books of poetry I've read in many years. Lim is the author of Loveliest Grotesque, winner of the 2006 Core Press First Book Award, chosen by Marilyn Chin. Her work is also included in the anthologies Girlesque and The Racial Imaginary. A 2015 Pushcart Prize winner, she has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony, the Vermont Studio Center, and the Getty Research Institute. Lim was born in Seoul, Seoul, Korea, and educated at Stanford University, UC Berkeley, and the Iowa Writers Workshop. She is an assistant professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Let's welcome Sandra Lim. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's great to be back here in Iowa City. It's been, I think, about 11 years since I've been back. And it's really great to be here at Prairie Lights, which is, I think, where I spent most of my time when I was in Iowa City. So I'm going to read exclusively from The Wilderness tonight. And keep time. I thought I would start with a few poems sort of from the beginning of the book that um, I think sort of proffer the kinds of questions that I'm trying to ask throughout this volume. So this first poem is called Amor Fati. Inside every world, there is another world trying to get out. And there is something in you that would like to discount this world. The stars could rise in darkness over heartbreaking coasts, and you would not know if you were ruining your life or beginning a real one. You could claim professional fondness for the world around you. The pictures would dissolve under the paint coming alive, and you would only feel a phantom skip of the heart, absorbed so in the colors. Your disbelief is a later novel emerging in the long, long shadow of an earlier one. Is this the great world, which is whatever is the case? The sustained helplessness you feel in the long emptiness of days is matched by the new suspiciousness and wrath you wake to each morning. Isn't this a relationship with your death too, to fall in love with your inscrutable life? Your teeth fill with cavities. There is always unearned happiness for some and the criminal feeling of solitude. Always, everyone lies about his life. The Vanishing World. It's said that people tend to believe God believes what they believe. When I was young, I loved to get up before every dawn of the world, still sweetly baffled by the possibility of unbelief. Perhaps grace is not so poor a thing that it can't also appear in this instance like a new definition of luck, akin to tiny blossoms out of cactus thorns in spring, their loneliness crushing your lungs. Isn't everything sloughed from the same star? What is believable and possible? What is acceptable and what is nothing? Caught between the old and new year, why do you think that the old will be famous for its pain, the new from the liberation from pain? Some kind of belief still runs off me in strings to enjoy the clarifying effect of participation without remainder may be the most mysterious thing. When I come to the right place, 
I believe I'll paint a door on it and walk right through. This is called Human Interest Story. Snow would have been breaking the drifts that day on a mild mood. My father was boarding at the home of a missionary couple in Seoul, getting by on books and the radio and cheap noodles. His older brother hanged himself that winter in Pusan. They would say afterward that it was a plain death, funded by bad numbers, some selfishness, unusual cold. Think of a needle dropped into the sea. He had a pleasantly objective feeling about himself that morning as the early sky gently ripped into red. He thought about business English, the truth of money. Across town, a diary opened and there were the white cooling coals in barrels. There was a pretty young wife and one serious boy and one very quiet girl. They awakened one day to a new planet where the spaces between people appeared slightly widened. Maybe you can't penetrate events with reportage, but facts have a sly, unanswerable texture that appears social. To relieve ourselves of open-ended narrative, we read into the winter stars all evening. There are just stars and stars and stars. We know what it's like to fall in love and be disassembled, but we still want to pull death right off the bodies of one another. These were spectacular nights, said my father. They were full of philosophy and political theory, noisy reversals, French movies. The romantic grace we comprehend sits with ease in the real world. It is almost nothing. Now he is carrion, stitched forever in the cramp of a trial. No one can evict us from books, he used to say, running through astonishment at full speed. I'm originally from California, and I moved to Massachusetts about five years ago. And we famously had a very difficult winter. So I'm going to read some poems about spring just to keep it coming. So, And they're sort of ag agonies and ecstasies of spring, mixed feelings. This one is called Snowdrops. Spring comes forward as a late winter confection, and I cannot decide if it advances a philosophy of meekness or daring. This year's snowdrops, is it that they are spare and have a slightly fraught lucidity, or are they proof that pain, too, can be ornate? Even a propped skull is human nature, and its humor is monstrous rich with an existence that owes nothing to anyone. Fat little pearls against the ice battering softly. Try even fewer qualities. To say that you love someone or something to death is to hover around the draw of irrevocability. More faith is asked of us, a trained imagination against the ice white. Above us are the last lights, planting something within us that also represents death for the taking at every turn, greeting the season all coated in soft silver with a strong handshake, loving and hating those buttons done up all the way to the top of your sweater. Right of spring, dimmed summer. The fortune teller reads my palm in the humid dark. 
that spring I could not be whole. Feeling atonal and unconciliatory, I went to see the rite of spring. I went to see what art in general is about and what people are really like. I wanted to watch the shape of a movement, the trajectory of a body as it makes the shapes that it will in a limited ambit, revolving around an implied center. The young virgin dances herself to death to bring forth the flowering of spring. Free verse rhythms, ritualized, vivid decisions of actions, I went to see what people are really like in a thousand human ways. All these gestures from life, deformed to suit a more open, imagined music. She won't make an affirmation or a negation of my destiny, but it's good for business. The way she eats through the score of a life and keeps me hypnotized by the future destination. I watch the fortune teller as I watch an absorbing movie. I just want to know what happens. Unfleur. Spring obliges my imagination of return. Then it annihilates it. What is death but reason in flawless submission to itself? No, not reason, something stonier. <coughs> I'm going to read some love poems. <laughs> um, this one is called Fall. Each night, the same dream. I'm an odd Victorian mansion in a field of wheat, and I'm either waiting for the field to catch fire or the hearse of love to pull up to the man's. Don't wake me. In daylight, my mother talks of bridliness as a measure of time, in a kind of flower, a narrative of ascension. I intimate some sort of border is being discussed but I can't concentrate for the sake of all the beautiful things claiming my attentions in the tawny fields. There, a blankness without meanness, such as one finds in a naked sea with all its fundamental majesty. This is this is a palindrome. It's called Cheval Sombra, or Dark Horse. From time to time, I like to learn a severe truth about a familiar deception, a beautiful watch lying new in its case, a precise, coruscating luxury. The future arrives under the sign of its own negation. A curious traversal of tenses, le dernier cri, and so the hope of even seeing you again is slipping. I'm so shaken, I act calmly for the rest of the afternoon. At last, I shall see my hunger for meaning go free. The world could be like a faraway planet to which I declare, free at last. I shall see my hunger for meaning go. I'm so shaken, I act calmly for the rest of the afternoon. The hope of even seeing you again is slipping. A curious traversal of tenses, le dernier cri, and so, the future arrives under the sign of its own negation. A precise, coruscating luxury a beautiful watch lying new in its case. I like to learn a familiar truth about a severe deception from time to time. This is Envoi Orpheus. I say the look back 
was coldness mixed with longing. Afterward, he could finally think. Many have imagined what the song must have sounded like. Not language breaking, not how safe it is to be gone, but the world seeping in so quickly. For a moment, world arranges itself around artist. The wine of annihilation rises within him, a new acuteness. Elsewhere, a disappointed lover mutilates another tree with the departed's initials, restored to disinterested making. I always say you can tell that poem to someone who breaks up with you. Obad. From the last stars to sunrise, the world is dark and enduring, and emptiness has its place. Then, to wake each day to the world's unwavering limits, you have to think about passion differently, again. Don't we forgive everything of a lover if we are the motive, if love promises to take us to many places, to even larger themes? Faithlessness is a heart glancing down a plumed avenue in which one is serenaded by myriad scattering birds. Thunder in the air begins opening appetites. Everyone is being true to themselves, they think. And then it is having your right arm sheared off and the whole world gets to touch you, chime your losses. I turn to my imagination but its eyes are still green as if from too much looking on at equatorial gardens. Still, if I were you, I would linger here, deepen in the rottenness, learn something about the world, about the desire for safety. Then I'd make an instrument from the ruins, something awfully beautiful. I would sit down to eat as if I were reading a poem I would observe how the night went into the day with a special grandeur. It could be like swallowing a sword and growing surprised by how good it is, how it opens. And then, maybe to sing out with a throat like that, saying, look, look how the world has touched me. Okay, I'm, I'll just read two more poems. I'll close with these two poems that I think, in retrospect, um, they were like little love poems to my future self. And they're the first and last poems of the book. Small Container, Fury. Rembrandt paints his carcass of beef. You see a little blood near the poppies and don't think of detachment. Humbert and his girl are driving across America. One has a thirst so unslakable, one walks right into the river. How exciting spring is and how errant, holding out love and death like a platter of the daintiest cakes. As I do my work, I think, let me topple, wear thin. Let the world eat me, but then let the world sob, not me. And finally, cliffs. Words are afraid up here. The rapture and the terrifying exposure. Strange birds roosting, a human voice shouting a world's end shout. Snow hurries to the meeting, wanting to cover the waking in my body. I could fill up the sea with this waking. The outlook is thrilling. It satisfies. It goes even further than the view from the heights of love. It eats the roof off the sky. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sandra Lim. Next up, Writer's Workshop graduate James Shea will read from his new book of poetry, The Lost Novel. Graham Faust says, equal parts deep trouble and heavy pleasure, the lost novel is makeup that gets its real on at the ever-breaking mirror we call the world. Lo and behold, James Shea is the James Shea of poetry. Mm -hmm. Shea is the author of Star in the Eye, selected for the 2008 Fence Modern Poets series, and named as a favorite book of 2008 by the Chicago Sun-Times. His translations of Japanese poetry can be found in the Iowa Review, Circum Circumference, and Jinyu. He currently teaches at Hong Kong Baptist University. Please welcome James Shea. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. I know some of you. Um, I'm just going to begin at the beginning with the first poem and, and end at the end with the last poem. I'm not going to read the whole book, though. I'm just going <laughs> to jump around. Thinking of work. A brief storm blew the earth clean. There was much to do. Sun to put up, clouds to put out, blue to install, limbs to remove, grass to implant. The grass failed. We ordered new grass. A limb cracked in half in the short storm, short with its feeling. We saw its innards, all the hollow places. Something flew out of the window, and then the window flew out of the window. City of the One-Sided Sun. We had considered what was said and how long it had never been heard. Now, when we're beyond credulity, can we insist on knowing what is true? Would that I were believed, shadowed by others to see which beliefs were mine. The walk of a stranger, movements of the earth are no longer believable. It's the act that matters, less the hydrant, red solid, quiet with water, more the belief in believing, the faith we have even in reason, a partial tree. Birth marked face. One. One monsoon ends, its after water rains from the winded leaves. Two. One accident runs deep inside me, carries my organs in a sack. Three. One street owes itself to another street, one tree owes another. Three Night Stand. Dream of a skinned alive tiger, its flesh gleaming, stepping inside an ill-fitting tiger suit, one foot not fully in its foot. Tiny Cathedral. She put her keys in her cap and her cap in her purse, and her purse in her car, and her car in her barn, and her barn in her field, and she sat in her patch, and she smiled at her lap. The Lost Novel One I wrote you once for years. I called you many names. Two, party of one, sexy hypothesis, Miss Bliss, the instrumentalist. Three, flashback from the prologue, a boy falls through a bridge, his body on display for days at the house, 
then burned into ashes and bone. Together, relatives separate his remains. Four. Some chapters just sketched out, others quite filled in. Five. Internal monologue. It's time to sleep. I lie awake. With whom did I walk to the pizza place? Dialogue. You're not who you were, nor are you who knew me to be as you. Six. Chapter six, seven, eight. Develop character. Seven. One should not be the judge of one's own honor, but there was something noble in our falling apart. Time is a leaving friend. Eight. I still have all my notes. Nine. Multiple afterwards. The sun sticks to the sky. A boy deep in the wood stops, stares down a dirt path, cap snug on his forehead, knees pink, looking fellow. Now I'm emotional. Go back the way you came, original person. There's a sequence in the book of uh, poems that resemble answers to uh, multiple choice questions. The question is unstated, uh, so it's a series of answers. I'll read some of those. This is the first one. Multiple choices. A. A lily trains a lily. B. A lily trains a grass blade. C. A grass blade trains a lily. D. A lily trains a blade. Multiple choices. A. It's the sound of the absence of sound. B. It's not soundlessness. C. It's the decay after hitting the whole note. D. It's the sound of being heard. Multiple choices. A. Nobody would notice me if I was a leaf. B. I would think about human feelings. C. The wind would blow a child into the house. D. Yes, I am not a leaf. The ever-breaking mirror. My car would not start, and then I remembered another car of mine that would not start, and that I had abandoned. I walked for some help and found a man filling tanks by hand. He filled my plastic tub with gas, and we talked of my two cars without gas. He invited me to a dinner where men turned an animal on a spit. They sent me away with a tent, a walking stick, and some rations. I didn't know which car to approach, each being on either side of the mountain. I headed for the one that I never knew if its lights were on or not. Acts of Fire It was said that we would burn, and we looked at the wet logs in the ring. It was said that we would burn, and we found dry wood and set the fire, and put our hands in the flames, and we burned, and we said, now we are burning. Now are we burning, and we said we burned, and we put the flames in our hands, and set the wood, and found the fire dry, and we said that it would burn. We wring the wet logs with our looks, and said wood that it would burn. Would it burn, we said, and the wet logs looked at our rings, and burn it would, we said, and the dry wood found the fire, and set the burned flames in our hands, 
and now we are we, said the burning. Rain's misstep. Rain said no. Rain said get the fuck out. Rain said you're wrong. Rain said you're wet, wet. Rain said that's it. Rain said keep walking. Rain said raise your arms. Rain said they will be heavy. Rain said you will learn to suffer better. Poem by Tolstoy. This poem owes a debt to Parker Smathers. June 18, 1850. Got up at 7.30. Did nothing before 11. 11 to 12, music. 2 to 5, the estate. 6 to 8, music. 8 to 11, toilet, music, and reading. October 28, 1860. Sunday. The one way to live is to work. To work, one must love work. To love work, the work must be attractive. To be attractive, it must be half done and well done. Ce is you. But what can one do? Fortune telling, irresolution, idleness, melancholy, thoughts of death. I must escape from this. There's only one way. Force myself to work. It's now one o'clock and I've done nothing. Must finish the first chapter after dinner. November 10th. For 10 years or so, I haven't had such a wealth of images and ideas as these last three days. I can't write, they are so abundant. Moscow. We saw the legs of a coyote run past into the grass during our evening drive through rolling mounds resembling kneeling bison. Such gorgeous hills make one wish to see the dark slopes where famous bodies may be buried, folded into their interior where the dirt meets the soil, and reminds one of the way water travels underground, or how temperature, some feet below the surface, is the same everywhere one goes. This land has a purchase on me, if there could be a monument to the journey we took, it would have to be grand and quiet and shabby and wearing thin of its paint with another monument showing through. The phrase you gave me. I wake often for an hour or more, falling asleep again until the late morning it's like having two days arising out of one, a shorter day, the first day, a one or two hour day serving to delay the longer day. I get two sleeps this way. Between sleep, my thoughts become serious wherever the ink darkens. I remember almost nothing of what I've written except that it begins thusly. Crows seal the sky. They speak of their suffering in long, distinct sentences. I think of carrion underwriting my work. When I'm awake, I cannot find a moment without a metallic whisper. I practice an old tradition of drawing sutras on my skin. My wayward ways are never without purpose. The purpose is simply not always productive, a purposeless purposiveness these days. Sculptress. Hand cut in the making of a thing. Seven black jackals twisted in mid-scream. Audible only to themselves. Trapped in black columns. Rising up from the floor like a seven-headed animal tied to a buried spine. A kind of aphrodisiac, their largesse. Their unnecessity expanding into spaces that barely asked for them.
center for weariness. He felt tired for the first time in his life. Previously, he had not recognized tiredness as one of the humors possible for him. It seemed a posture taken on by the people he passed on the street or who lived in his building. Yes, he would sleep each night, but not out of tiredness. He would sleep because he wished to sleep, to explore the experience of closing his eyes and dreaming. But this was different. He felt tired, and there was no one to explain the sensation to him. He found a rock on which to sit and thought to himself, other people must be feeling something akin to this. It would be wise to set up some kind of testing ground for the feelings orbiting around my tiredness. But first it had to be defined more clearly, so he set about sketching a self-portrait to capture the nature of his situation. He could barely lift the charcoal to the sketch pad. He decided to ask someone to draw his portrait, but no one happened to come by until an older person, a neighbor, saw him looking around and approached him. Yes, I'd be happy to draw you, he said, taking the charcoal and paper. Now let me see. I'll be sure to get your entire visage. He sat still, swallowing his sighs. He wanted to sleep, but even sleeping seemed too great for him. Poem. Woke up moments ago, went directly to the writing center. Drive in, rode home, deer hit, legs flailing rapidly, like it's trying to run away, upside down. Correct my errors, please. Supervenience. I walked with one of deeper feeling to the park of serious conversation. We found pebbles that matched our mood, cloud-shaped stones. We walked as if the last fortnight had not happened, and we were back to our first circuit around the city, toward the harbor, where we had seen a sailboat turning through the wind, when our lapses in joy made us feel, at worst, unevenly happy. We spoke as though we had wanted the world to intervene, reminding us again how one wants to be simple and unique. As Sontag said of Osler, our walk had a way of turning time into space, and we kept the secret of our steps to ourselves, but it was an open secret, the key to keeping pace. I remembered standing inside a tunnel in the Paris metro, watching only the individual style of each person's gait. It can be difficult to see past one's own concentration. Sky set, night rise. Take today, for instance. It keeps wanting to happen. Rapid, rapids springing from the ground, darting across lawns, each in its own orbit, there had been so many solo walks during those first days without weather. It helped us to spin out our thoughts so we'd feel less trapped by the sense that what we'd done was probably wrong. You had a year of walks about which I wrote in the manner of an old poet. Living simply near a crystalline lake, cold waters filling with drizzling rain, when you called to my house, I was in the building of many books. Dusk approaches, wild geese overhead. The mind can build upon the brain. Returning through the mountain pass, thinking of the lady of long walks. My dead in life mocked me as I lived it, ridiculed me for recognizing its ridicule. My thoughts were like an inner room pinched off from the vestibule where I once stood. Yet moving you, I was moved by you, and most walks require enough steps to go out and get back again. Each walk we take a kind of labyrinth in the original sense, 
that is, a maze in which you cannot be lost, one path leading only in one direction. Turn around and you'll come back out. Naturally, the journey has its impact as the foot upon the ground. It recalls a waking dream from many years ago. I feel one way and not the other, floundering, the king of something, spinning into myself. Hello, you. Welcome to my continuous birthday, sleeper cell of one, tiny newcomer, everyone their own kind of scream. Thank you very much. Thank you, James Shea. Finally, uh, International Writing Program alumna Dorothy Shea will read from her collection of 13 short stories, Snow and Shadow. And I'll just quickly say that um, we have more copies of Snow and Shadow coming. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't arrive today. Uh, but if we run out, please see me and I'll um, take down your name and we can reserve one of the copies that we have coming. Sorry about that. Snow and Shadow, or excuse me, Amy Russell says, Snow and Shadow challenges the boundaries and limitations of our narrow conventional realities and forces us to re-examine our perspective of the world. Many will find this enchanting collection of transformative tales will, like a shadow, follow them along after the final page. Dorothy Shea is at the forefront of a talented new generation of writers who are exploring issues of identity from the unique vantage point of Hong Kong. She is the founding editor of the literary magazine Fleur, Fleurs de, de Lettres. <laughs> Sorry, my, my French, excuse my French, and currently lives in Hong Kong and teaches at Hong Kong Baptist University. Please welcome Dorothy Shea. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, I write in Chinese and the uh, uh, magazine that I co-found with the other people is a Chinese magazine, but it's tried to be cool, so we pick a French name, Ferdiler. Um, so this book, uh, I have uh, three books in Chinese, so uh, short stories, and this is my first book in English. It's translated by Nikki Harmon, uh, who is a Brit British translator. Uh, tonight I'm going to read one story, uh, some excerpts from one story of my book. Uh, the story is called Breasted bodies uh, in Cantonese is Hang Fok San Tai. So I guess it's a love story happened in a place called Wyland, and the place uh, is famous for its sex industry, where if you have no money, you can trade your body parts uh, for sexual services. Wyland has no Wyland had no marriage system, but was famous for its prosperous sex industry. Even bartering was allowed. When the male clients could not afford to pay, they could obtain sexual services by trading their body parts. At the moment of sec sexual arousal, a man would stand in the doorway, peeping into a dim room where a woman we kind on the, s on the bed. Once she adopted the desired position, he no longer cared about his arms or legs. But with the ebbing of arousal, the man would open his eyes to see what had once been his limb, first amputated, then frozen, bottled, and removed. Only then would he be astonished at the impulsive decision he had made. Amputees could be seen all over Wyland, hobbling heroically along the street, city streets. The limbs that had once belonged to them were stored in special depots. There, glass bottles of all sizes were arrayed on rusty iron shelves in packed rows. The reflected lights make the limbs floating in preserving fluid appear glossy deformed. Soon they would be loaded onto ships and sold to the developed countries that bordered Wyland. At times of peat arousal, 
the impoverished men of Wyland mute around in the street, gazing up at the dead leaves that float from the trees or down at their own big feet. In the sunshine, they were accompanied by anxious shadows that crept along behind them, looming over the bodies to which they were attached. So uh, what happens in the story is that a girl uh, go to Wyland with her brother. The brother, her brother was surprised when she said she wanted to go out, go outside and put up leaflets to sell herself. She had headlights. He made her sit on a stool and he carefully separated the strands of her hair, combing out the gray black eggs with a fine toothed comb so that they popped onto a metal tray. He had to crack the really stubborn ones between his fingernails before he could pull them out. They said you could wait six months, said her brother, dousing her head with gasoline and wrapping it in a towel. There was a powerful sting in the air. The girl paid no attention. She just smiled. Her face was, was covered in dimples so that when she smiled, it always looked as if she was crying. The girl told them she wanted a huge mirror so that she could see her whole body. It should be smooth, shimmering, and reflect her in the minutest detail. When she washed her hair, she would sit in front of the mirror and call it up. Then she would strip naked and look at her budding figure. She was so skinny that her bone structure was clearly visible under the skin. Under her right breast, there was one abnormal sunken rib. What do you think? Her brother was standing by her bed, looking out, at, looking out the window at the scenery. Too pale, too thin, said her brother. How about these? asked the girl, indicating the slight protuberances of her breasts. Them too. But the girl realized her brother was not looking at her properly, so paying no attention to what he thought. She dressed again, grabbed a sheaf of leaflets and ran down downstairs. All down the stairwell, the walls were completely covered with black leaflets and there were more in the noodle shop at the bottom of the stairs. The people slurping their noodles and looking through the window at a world made dark by the leafless thought it was the end of the world. No matter, the sorrow they felt sharpened their appetites and the hot noodles made them a little tipsy. The steam from their bowls obscured the cause features, and in their excitement, men and women began to play footsy under the tables. The young man came over to the girl. His, he was dressed in a baggy black sweater, and his hair was cropped short. The girl, the girl had not realized until then just how pallid he was, almost like someone in a black and white photograph. He tore down one of her leaflets, and a single patch of red appeared on each pale cheek. It was, for the girl, as rich a color as the bloodied plastic bags that she had seen in the street. The mother, seeing her one-armed son standing in the doorway, was not surprised. It was as she had foreseen. The night sky was not very dark. There was a row of four street lamps, but only one of them emit a flickering light. And her son stood under in it and her son stood under it in his black sweater. His empty left sleeve dangled limply, showing that now he was a man. He had grown tall and slender and looked as desolate as an empty row. 
His amputation did not worry his mother. All the men in Wyland learned to do everything one-handed from boyhood, even buttoning their coats with both feet, as well as all sorts of other minor tasks. What did worry her was the way he lay in bed, biting his fingernails and smiling a little smile. He just looked too blessed. It seemed that he didn't regret the loss of an arm at all. Silently, in a funereal mood, his mother got his dinner ready. Her son carried on lying on the bed, his head to one side, his eyes shut, day after day, in the same position. His mother was mostly puzzled by this, although sometimes the scene filled her with an almost religious fervor. Hots of ants began to gather at his bedside, as, with, as if on a pilgrimage. His mother took a broom, and as she swept, heaps of Coca-Cola cans crattered out from under the bed. She remembered how, years before, he used to lie in bed, obs obsessed by books on witchcraft. He ate nothing as he read. He just drank Coke. He kept this up for four years. After his mother washed the old Coke cans, she covered the walls of the house with them and used them to erect a fence outside the house too. The dazzling wet of the cans filled her with a, nearly, with a near certainty that he would risk his life for his obsession. Once when she was sure that her son was asleep. She located the ten cans in the cold wall that she had marked and stuffed with $20 bills and skillfully extracted them. After she checked to make sure that none of the money was missing, she hesitated for a long time, thinking about whether to use the money to fulfill her son's desires, but finally decided against it. Before putting the cans back in place, she took a roll of bills from one of them and put it under the seventh floorboard from the door, the one next to the wall. The money would be enough to give her son a decent funeral, she thought to herself. The girl had few visitors, and those that did come hardly ever come back for another visit. The girl had nothing to do. She stood on the bed with her brother, looking out the tiny window into the narrow, narrow alley outside. Occasionally, there were passerbys, and the girl made her brother guess whether they would come upstairs. By now, the weather was getting warmer. People were wearing clothes that are too tight and made them puff and pant. Two men stood down below, looking up at the doors at the girl's window. They stood there for a long time. They won't come, her brother said, as she always did. The girl was indignant. She stuck her head out of the window and waved energetically. But the men below lowered their heads and hurried away. Her brother could not help smiling. He had not told the girl how he detested her shutting the apartment door and making him wait outside. When that happened, he fidgeted anxiously, then got out his pen and wrote random characters all over the gray wall. On and on he wrote until his hand and arm etched. Um, when the visitor finally left, the girl liked to go up to the wall, connect the characters and make them into a song. She would sing out hoarsely, Hua hua you that ta ta la la shabu doing me he ya. She made the tone sound quite fetish, fetish, and could make it up until evening. Her brother 
particularly dis- disliked having visitors in the evening, because if no one came, the girl would put her arms around his neck, bury her head in his armpits, and fall fast asleep. When she woke up again, she would tell him all the dreams she had had. Just at that moment, someone else came into view down in the street. It was the young man, now one-eyed, walking with the aid of a stick, tapping his way along with a cheerful rhythm. Of all the visitors, her brother disliked the young man most, because when he and the girl shut the door on, he, when the girl and when he and the girl shut the door on him, it always felt like a century before they opened it up again. Why land folk all know all knew that the young man had already lost an arm and a leg, and an eye for the girl. You should hang on to your arm. The girl told him, to stroke my face, my thigh, and my ribs. What else can you give them? It is my liver this time," said the young man, with a slight smile, his pale face flushing once more. The girl was reassured and smiled. Everyone said that when the girl smiled, it always looked as if she was crying. The girl did not know if the young man ever visited again, because soon afterwards, she left Wyland. On her brother's bed, she discovered a ball of cash. They want you to get rid of the child," said her brother. But his mouth was was full of toothpaste, and the girl could not understand what he was saying. When he finished brushing brushing his teeth and went back into the room to find her, the girl was gone, wandering aimlessly and along through the streets. On the pavement, there was a one-eyed man, making stuff creamless with golden yellow cream. Too much of it. The girl, the girl bought one. It was the first time she had tasted one of these golden creamless. Its sweetness startled her, as did the fact that she liked it very much. The street cleaner was washing down the pavement with detergent. The girl sat on a bench, nibbling carefully at the creamlet until it was all gone. By the time she had finished, bubbles were rising up from the street to the air, sailing towards some nearby railings in the morning sunlight, and then brushing, perhaps because the sun was too bright. Beyond the railings. Countless silent balls were moored. The girl finally bought herself a boat ticket to an unknown destination. When she stepped on that, it felt curiously stable. She would not have known they were moving, but for the ship's horn. After she got pregnant, she did not vomit any more. Her body felt heavier and heavier. And even standing on deck, she did not feel like she was floating. It was night, and the boat passengers had gone to sleep. The girl discovered the cabin was full of doors, all with bows. She tried to open them, and realized they are not real bows at all. There was nothing left. There was nothing behind most of the doors. Just an enormous hold with, which seemed bigger than the entire boat. Behind one, however, was a room filled with bottles of yellow liquid. Each bottle was marked with a time and date. The largest bottles were filled with very long legs. The smallest held eyeballs. The girl crouched down and found a bottle. With a small bright eyeball in it, she picked it up and put it in her pocket. Once she remembered, this eye had been firmly embedded in the young man's face. 
she realized that there was one woman on the boat who was not asleep. The woman's son had died a week before. The woman had sold as many of her son's body parts as she could. So she did not have to pay a cent for the funeral. The mother, old and fate looking, had decided to leave Wyland after it was over. Before she left, she strung together some of the coke cans she had stored in her son's room and attached them to her only long skirt. Now she was on the boats, and the, clink, the clinking of the cans with their glittering red color was her way of grieving for her son. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy Shea. And also thanks to James Shea and uh, Sandra Lim. And thanks to all of you for coming. And the authors will be happy to sign copies of their books for you. And if necessary, book plates for the books that haven't arrived yet. Thanks. <laughs>